Well, as it turns out, our brain is actually using symmetry almost kind of as an evaluation. It is evaluating for what is known as oxidative stress. Now, research in Oxford, British Columbia, New Mexico, Rio de Janeiro, all across the world have confirmed this time and time again that oxidative stress is correlated with what is known as fluctuating asymmetry. Okay, so what is this oxidative stress? Oxidative stress, we've probably all actually experienced. If you've ever been to the beach, if you've ever gotten a tan, that's caused by oxidative stress. And a little bit of it, it's fine. People aren't going to notice. People might say, oh, you, you got a tan. Did, did you get a tan? But what oxidative stress does when it piles up is that it damages cells. It causes damage to our DNA, and you get a bad, really bad sunburn. So essentially, what our brain is looking at when it looks at symmetry is ultimately oxidative stress. And that is what our mind perceives as attraction. OK, so enough about vision. We understand how that works. What happens after you get to see someone that you, know, you feel attracted towards? Well, it may look something a little bit like this. <laughs> you notice them. You awkwardly walk up to them. You look. And you consider for just the longest time, you know, maybe I want to get to know them. Maybe I want to talk to them. And now, this happened with my friend, obviously. He says, hey. Um, you look lost. <laughs> Cl classic opening. Silence. Takes a deep breath. Are, are, are you new this year? Yes. And as always, the gentleman with the knight in shining armor, let me help you. In reality, what is this exchange actually doing for us? If we think about it, when we walk up closer to someone, when we move closer to them, we're really allowing our other senses, specifically our sense of smell and our sense of hearing, to get to know that certain individual better. Now, hearing is just picking up on the tone of someone's audio, but what's really interesting is our sense of smell. Now, we often associate smell with perfume, cologne. Oh, that person smells nice. You know, maybe I'm going to get a little bit closer. Not stalker at all. But, <laughs> but there's even the French way of uh, classically putting on perfume of spraying the air and then walking t through it. But ultimately, perfume plays actually a very small role in what our brain decides is attractive. What it's actually looking for are various chemicals. Now, a study done in uh, 2009 uh, at Denmark, which was actually a repeat of multiple studies that had been done throughout the uh, 1990s and the 1980s uh, across the world, was actually what is known in a series of studies called the T-shirt studies. So what they essentially did was they had a uh, woman wear two different T-shirts. One T-shirt uh, three days during the ovulation period, and another T-shirt three days while they were not ovulating. And then, they invited 200 males to come and take a whiff of these t-shirts. <laughs> the findings, the findings, it may astound you, but they are surprising. As it turns out, guys have the ability to, to, to detect subconsciously whether or not someone is ovulating. OK, but that's enough, that's enough, that's enough, that's enough. That, that's enough about guys. Our sense of smell is wondrous, and females are no different. In fact, compared to guys, I think women are even more powerful. They are able to identify a chemical called MHC. Now, this chemical was first identified in rats. Uh, what, what we found was that you know, MHC differences, what they do is they create a stronger immune system for our body. The more diverse your MHC, the better immune system, since they act as little flags for your cells to say, oh, I'm being invaded, oh, no, don't worry, I'm healthy. So they repeated a similar trial. And as you can probably guess, um, the scent was not correlated with an ovulating male. That would be quite weird. <laughs> what they found was that this MHC molecule was actually related to how similar or how dissimilar people were. The more dissimilar, the, more, the larger the variety of MHC that the male had in comparison to the female, the more attractive the scent was in the sense of a pleasant smell. So, what does this all mean? 
Well, two things. One, we scientists really, really enjoy making people sniff t-shirts. But the second more important thing is that, although we may not realize it immediately, when people say things like, oh, you know, I can smell my boyfriend or my girlfriend from 100 meters away, they actually might be able to subconsciously detect it. And regarding the exact range, we actually aren't co exactly sure, but we know that it is definitely there. Okay, so enough about scent. What happens once you get to know a person, so to speak, get, get close to them? Well, if we think about it, the closer a couple gets, the more touchy they get, PDA, so to speak. And what does this touch do? What does this touch do? It actually creates a bond. We prefer the contact of human skin, obviously. It creates a sense of intimacy. But what's really interesting is actually taste. Now, <laughs> taste in general. In general, people do not lick each other. That would be quite weird. But the first kiss, that's what we're all about. Classically portrayed in movie scenes in the rain, because who doesn't like being wet? But the important, <laughs> but the important thing, the important thing to note is the diversity of responses. In a sense, the first kiss can really make it or break it. Now, Pamela Regan at uh, Cal State um, Los Angeles conducted a very uh, somewhat informal survey, and she essentially asked responders, you know, what was your first kiss experience like? And they varied. They went from, oh, it was magical, it was so beautiful, and, you know, I was happy to have finally done it, to, it was the most disgusting thing ever. <laughs> but why is there such a large variety of responses? As it turns out, Females are much more picky at this stage because they are much more capable than guys. Guys are lame at this point. I'm sorry, I'm a guy too. But we kind of suck at this. <laughs> Females are much more capable. They are able to detect a wide variety of chemical and especially the hormonal composition of a body. So, okay, we, they get to detect the hormones, so what? And at this point, the science isn't really clear yet. We have a few theories. The first theory, it's for seduction. So. We kiss, and then you get seduced. Sexual arousal increases, yay. But the thing is, <laughs> but the thing is, but the thing is, in reality, that actually doesn't happen. Multiple studies, repeated over and over again, have found that when couples kiss, there isn't necessarily a correlation. In fact, a study at the University of Oxford specifically demonstrated that you know, there wasn't even a change in specific hormonal composition. That seems weird. Okay, so second hypothesis is for bonding purposes, just like touch. And that makes a little bit more sense. There are many cultures around the world where kissing is used as a form of greeting. And okay, of course, that's not lip-to-lip -lip kissing, but it's still the act of intimacy. It's the act of getting close to another human being. But the third thing, and what seems the most lame, but I do have a little bit of evidence to back up, is it's for assessment. <laughs> that's right, you're being assessed. What this hormonal exchange actually does is it essentially tells the brain, oh, this person has X, Y, Z, uh, blood, type, blood type O uh, or blood type AB minus, and you know, that's different from mine. And this person also, yes, I've confirmed it, definitely. His MHC molecule is different from mine. Yes, I think this person is attractive. <laughs> or no, that person is, has the same DNA as me. I don't want to get close to someone who has a similar DNA to me. No, no, get away. So when we think about it, Essentially, our brain is running through a checklist. Now, we do have to keep in mind that this is just the love at first sight idea. In terms of long-term marriage, long-term relationship, that depends, actually does depend a lot more on, psych on psychological differences, whether personality, activities, hobbies, interests. But in terms of that giddy, swooning, indescribable feeling you feel when you meet someone, that you just think, oh, I finally found my soulmate. That that is your brain's checklist. That is your brain saying, get closer. I want to get to know that person better. So next time you see someone that you think, ooh, hottie, ooh. <laughs> Don't run away. Don't run away. I've seen too many people say, oh yeah, you know, that person's too attractive. They, they would never like me. But the thing is, it's your brain telling you they're attractive. It's your brain saying, ooh, that person is a good match. Please let me get to know them better. So don't back away, get closer. 
Be brave. Walk forward. <laughs> and get and actually say, hello, my name is Steven. <laughs> and really, and really, 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 be willing to take that risk. So if you walk away with one thing today, please walk away with the realization that when you love someone, even if it's indescribable, your brain is providing you with the reason. Thank you.